Okay. Well, um, I guess, you know, many people ask me, how did you come to do what it is you do? Um, because it's not a usual thing. Um, it's not a usual path, and it certainly wasn't a straight path. And yet, I feel like probably my whole upbringing and my whole life was um, priming me, um, teaching me, holding me, challenging me, um, arguing with me to do what it is um, that I do. And um, so I'll, I'll just tell a little bit about how I first landed in Minneapolis and where um, where I landed, I think, is probably the most important piece of this. So I grew up in a family that moved a lot. My father was a minister, so I was born in Columbus, Ohio, and then we moved to a very rural town outside of Detroit, Michigan. Then we moved to a suburb of Washington, D.C., um, which is very critical and crucial because it was at the time of a lot of fomenting um, activity where uh, the assassination of both of the Kennedys and Dr. Martin Luther mm -hmm. King happened mm -hmm. and also um, the huge Vietnam War protests that and all the civil rights um, uh, vision was trundling forward and um, the pod of people that I was connected with, both at my high school um, and then particularly at the church, which was a very small church, but it had people who had even been connected with Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. So it was like, for me, it was a grounding of um, why to do this work was grounded in both the liturgical structures of a year, but the grounding of what is possible in terms of justice, goodness, wonder, thanks um, in the world. And um, when we left that place, we moved to a steel mill town outside of Pittsburgh. And it was a really difficult move for me. I was a junior in high school. Why move right at that moment? Um, I went into a depression and my parents considered sending me to a boarding school um, because I had been, I don't know, I had been a good student, right? I was challenged by the, um, by the academics. It was an exciting kind of place. The school that I went to was good in Maryland. Um, and then when I was faced with the possibility of not being in this place, of, um, it's called Ambridge, Pennsylvania, named after the American Bridge Company. I decided, no, I'm gonna be here. I'm only with my family for one more year, and let's see what, what this is. It ended up being um, a rather important time because one is I met um, one of my very dear friends who ended up following me here eventually, Susan Gust, and the two of us then um, became hooked with a, a man um, who was a priest in the town and we started organizing. We organized a place where youth could come because um, it was a time period when many people felt very lost and where do you go? And in this steel mill town, it's like there was nowhere to go. Um, we ended up doing hunger walks in, throughout the whole county. Um, and we would just organize um, anti-war protests um, because no one else was doing it. Whereas in Washington, D.C., we were joining the huge marches that were happening in, you know, in, in Washington. So it was really my first, um, my first organizing in, in that kind of way. Um, when I left, I came to Wisconsin. I went to Beloit College. Um, and Beloit had a thing where um, you had to be on campus your whole first year and the summer, 
which was really difficult for me because I just wanted to be on the streets because it was that time mm. period. I was studying organic chemistry because I thought I was going to be a doctor. I was taking all the pre-med courses. I remember very specifically taking the book and throwing it against the wall on the 4th of July and saying, why am I studying this when the world is on fire? Mm. And for the fall term, we had to choose somewhere to go to have an experience. I wanted to go somewhere where um, issues of social justice and ethical decision making through common sense was being um, modeled. Um, I considered going to New York City and to the um, United Nations and to see who was lobbying the United Nations and what's the difference between the whole legal and lawyers and people who come with their hearts and their good sensibilities and their um, histories and their personal experience and how are those things weighed against each other. And for some reason I ended up coming to Minneapolis mm -hmm. because, because there was a person whose writings at the time when I was in high school in the Washington DC area, um, he was, it was things coming through the curriculum of the church, the American Lutheran Church at that time. Um, his name was Joe Bash, but it was radical. And the artwork that was in it was just super cool. And I just went, ooh, I want to see what Joe Bash is doing. So I ended up coming to Minneapolis um, for that semester and working at the, um, the headquarters of the American Lutheran Church in the youth department. And they were sending me out to all these different places, mostly around the western half of the United States, which I had never been before because I knew the eastern half. So, but what that did was it made me think, I don't want to be, I don't want to be so connected to the church um, as, it, as it was so much. Because, um, not that I didn't appreciate all of the philosophies of the liberation theology, which has been a total core, but I just was too close to the church as a business, and it didn't, it was so different from the kind of, um, I don't know, the kind of sense that I grew up with, with my family in these very um, <coughs> raw, situations and the kind of servanthood that I saw my father give um, and it just was like big you know big divides so but what what did happen was that when I came I was placed in the house it was um, it used to be a convent the building was a convent and it was now a collective household right in East Phillips neighborhood right across from um, Little Earth of United Tribes. In fact, the newer part of Little Earth of United Tribes was a deep hole in the ground where they had just torn down <coughs> South High School, I guess the old building of South High School, which I never saw, but I saw the hole that it left. And I watched the newer part of Little Earth rise. And what happened to me was that I started going and listening um, to people speaking um, in the gymnasium. I heard the early leaders of the American Indian Movement speak, and I just thought, this makes sense to me in a way that, like, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't in my head. It, well, it was in my head, but it was, it just like, I just suddenly felt like I was touching the ground. And all of the places, of social activism and anger and seeing the disparities were brought forward in these um, orators, um, orations of profound anger and truth and weaving of deep spirituality that was connected to the earth. And I felt like, oh my goodness, you know, like um, here I am in this place in this community. And so it was from that place that I just started um, being 
connected to that neighborhood, which then became, um, grew into the, the puppet theater. And um, yeah, that's the beginning. You mentioned... How did I start doing puppets, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I can, well, do, I can talk about that, yeah, I guess. That would be a fine place to go. Well, is there so. something else you wanted first? Well, I guess the, the, the one tag I, I got early was, uh, you know, the, the mention of liturgy and the, the sort of the, the early familiarity with liturgy as something, and the liturgical year as something that was important to you. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you might say a little more about that. Yeah. Um, well, I think there were probably two things in um, in uh, those. Uh, well, my teenage years really is what it would have been. Well, actually, my whole um, youth um, that our lives were ordered around a liturgical year, and um, I think in the Christian Church you mostly see that as the various holidays that you do. But if you're connected with people who take that more seriously, deeply, they also see the connection of that to the earth and to the, um, the, the turnings always of light and dark in that circular kind of way. And so if you can um, listen deep enough into it, then you can see the, the connecting of that to, to old, old religions and for me um, as a growing feminist um, seeing it in connections to um, you know, evaluating the patriarchy the matriarchy and and all of those things uh, and it was it gave a framework into how um, how you order your life it's like something moves but it's going to change into another thing. And then how important to pause at certain moments, either um, as yourself noting that or as a community coming together. And that early household that I lived in specifically had a 40-day philosophy where um, at, we paused every 40 days. And sometimes we intentionally did a, uh, you know, like just journaling or uh, being doing a personal thing. Sometimes we would um, sit as a household and say, "Okay, here we are, another forty days." Um, and sometimes we would we would host dinners for um, a larger group of people. And so that idea of the importance of marking time and recognizing that we are always um, coming together, never exactly the same. <laughs> but coming together um, just was, was really important. I think the other thing was growing up um, close to Washington, D.C., and um, seeing some of the, like the pomp and circumstance that would unfold in the streets of um, various parades or pageantry, and in particular that time period of the assassination of, of um, of JFK Kennedy um, and to see like to walk the streets and hear no matter where you were this tolling bell mm. and people covering their mantles at their doors and their places of work mm. and with black cloth and um, and to see the the procession the funeral procession of how um, how connected uh, people were. Like, it, it, I mean, the bands would play, right? And there is a s certain somberness, but then if they weren't playing, they shuffled their feet. Mm -hmm. And when you have a whole group of people doing that, it makes a sound. It's like a dance. It's like a choreography. And the horse, the horse, the black stallion, with the stirrups, the empty stirrups, and someone leading it, and it, the whole time it was like trying to get away from there. I mean, like that just like 
without words, it said something about immense grief at a time of something that isn't right, um, and then followed by just the whole world in cars um, being there. And so like that, that affected me. Like, how do we, how do we hold, um, I mean, I, actually, I've never really thought about it before you're asking me, but how do we hold public ceremony? And what are the images um, that we can find that hold uh, hold what the moment is? You know, how do we listen deeply into it? Yeah. So that's one thing. And then there was another question. How did I become a puppeteer? Mm -hmm. Can I right? just follow up for just a second on, on your first answer? Uh, that. Um, you're, you're speaking of yourself as, as, as a watcher of, of public events and being affected by them. Had you at the time you began to get involved in work in Minneapolis also worked in creating ceremonies? Totally. Uh -huh. Oh, had I before yeah, that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, well, uh, yeah, actually, I mean, yeah, how did the sense of theater come in? I think probably was also from the church because, you know, that has church's theater and there's particular ways you move and there's, you know, various things and, you know, <laughs> bless my father's heart, right, who isn't alive still. But often, you know, I went to church a lot. I had to go to church a lot. And so I would often sit there and I would stare at the rafters and I would see things as words were happening. Maybe I wasn't hearing it exactly, but I would almost like, I would see the theater of what the stories were happening in the rafters. Um, and so then when I came here and I was working at the youth department, one of the things I was asked to do was to help um, create a big event that happened. Where was that one? I think it was in Houston, Texas. It was maybe in, or Dallas, or I can't remember, anyway. It was either New Orleans, Dallas, or Houston, because I, I did all three and I would have to think just to think about which one that was or ask someone. But anyway, what it was was like this huge convention, lots and lots of youth from all over the country. And I had gone to one as a high schooler in New York City. So I had kind of known what it was and it had affected me, you know, like it was wow, exciting to be suddenly in New York City and Madison Square Gardens and hear Peter, Paul and Mary right there, mm -hmm. see Pete Seeger and, you know, it was great. Um, so they um, wanted me to help think about how some of the things happened. Um, and they knew I was an artist at that point. I didn't really know I was an artist, but they could see it. Um, and so I designed certain things and um, costumes and things like that. So yeah, I was already starting to like understand big movement patterns of people. Yeah, how, what is that? Like, <laughs> what was it in my past lives that, you know, I don't know, but um, yeah. So I thought I was going to be a doctor. And when I um, decided not to go back to college and that I would immerse myself in this neighborhood in Minneapolis, the job that I got was at the hospital so that I could be there and just be connected to that world. And when I started getting famous in the hospital for my, the designs I made on the bulletin boards, <laughs> rather than my nursing care, <laughs> Then I was like, okay, maybe I should, you know, maybe, I don't know. And then there was a theater starting that was called Circle of the Witch Theater. And they were um, rehearsing in the household that I lived in, that communal household. And I started making a huge sculpture for them. I made it out of plaster. Um, I made a huge mess. It was heavy. Um, but one of the women said, uh, 
that actually reminds me of the work of the Bread and Puppet Theater. She had gone mm -hmm. um, to Goddard College in Plainfield, Vermont. And I was like, well, what's the Bread and Puppet Theater? And she said, well, she told me a little bit about it. And she said, there is an organization that's starting in Minneapolis from that inspiration. So little did I know that the Powderhorn Puppet Theater was just starting. And it was started by David O'Fallon and Ray St. Louis. David O'Fallon, in particular, who had done his doctoral dissertation in um, theater and community. And he had worked a little bit with the um, uh, San Francisco Mime Troupe and Bread and Puppet, and then the Alive and Trucking Theater here in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And um, he did a show, this is before I was a part of it, he did a show in Powderhorn Park on the 4th of July, which is what we count as our birthday at, in the Heart of the Beast, um, called A Boat, A Boot, A Book, A Ball of Yarn. Mm -hmm. After that, they did an ex like uh, indoor uh, show, and right after that, I, I, you know, crossed Lake Street from Phillips into Powderhorn <laughs> neighborhood and um, went into the basement at Walker Community Church where um, this theater was starting. So based on that first show, um, Ray and David decided that they would leave the Alive and Trucking Theater and start the Powderhorn Pup Puppet Theater. Mm -hmm. So I took a, a class, um, I remember I made, of course I made a skeleton figure, and I made a rod puppet of a, I don't know, I don't, you know, like a spirit kind of thing. Um, I remember what it looks like, but I don't know how to describe it or say what it was. And um, they said, you know, we're hiring people, do you want to? like apply and I did and got the job and I sort of I don't know there was something well I was you know I was a sculptor I guess um, because I had done that all through my youth just with anything I could get my hands on um, and then I just started seeing what would happen if you give that breath and stories that come together and then you suddenly make a circle of people with performing. Um, and then we heard that the Bread and Puppet Theater was gonna end, so a number of us piled into a car and drove out to see the last show, but it was the last show at Goddard College. Mm -hmm. And then they went dark for a very short time and then reemerged in northern Vermont. And they're still, alive so it's mm. it was totally fake news right <laughs> um, but it got us out there and it got me seeing this magnificent work and it took my breath away mm. and at that moment I I just went yes this is mm. this is what I want to do because I could see the movement um, connected with the sculpture connected with the ritual connected with the story connected with people and it was there in beautiful Vermont right with a river and these green hills and who wouldn't swoon at that and I was very young I was I think I was probably 20 20 years old so It's a very, um, for me, it's a very useful um, way of being able to um, investigate things in the world because you don't have to be, it doesn't have to be a human conversation. Um, puppets can uh, rise from many places. They can be from the inside of you and you suddenly can have a conversation with it. It can be a bird and you can have a conversation. It can be an ancient city and you can have a conversation. It can be a worm and yet we know that all these things live um, together. So it's not about like a human and another human and talking, talking theater. 
Not that that also isn't wonderful theater, just saying. But for me, um, the visual movement um, conversation that happens between realms um, is what drew me in. I remember at, at the last May Day Parade, everyone was pretty amazed because one of the dog puppets got a response from an actual dog, <laughs> an appropriately doggy response, <laughs> as if it were a dog. Uh, so, sort of the mythic end of this, the the talking to things that aren't human idea was very important for you. Uh, it, it wasn't about plaster and paper mache entirely. It was about a, a dialogue you wanted to have. Well, I think that, um, I mean, for me, uh, Well, uh, you know, of course, the the substance of it, the uh, my hands in the clay, uh, is like is like an amazing um, sensuous act, um, which drew me in. But really, for me to make art for art's sake was never like a part of what I could do or sustain. For me, it's always been uh, about an investigation, honestly, of um, how to be in the world, and in particular, my activist side of how the world can be healthier, um, more just, um, more living in common sense, um, right relationship, and always trying to figure out what that is and recognizing how we fall down and we rise. And um, so I, you know, like I've come to, uh, to hold a word, th that word wonder, um, a lot. I find that I, I, that that is kind of something that I come back to again and again. And it's wonder um, with an exclamation point and wonder with a question mark. Mm -hmm. And the wonder with the exclamation point is really about me continually opening every cell of my body, my mind, my heart, to what is here, which is so amazing. This life, this breath, this world, this place, these people, this tree, this something I'm hearing, the amazing fomenting powers of the earth that are so diverse and yet so ordered at the same time, like, um, you know, life. It's just like incredible. And then given that abundance and incredible wisdom of the earth, why is there so much violence and poverty and hatred, and self-hatred, um, and the, the hatreds, the self-hatreds that perpetrate such difficult things in the world. Why? Why? Why isn't there enough? Why would someone kill someone? Why would someone dump oil in water? I mean, it just goes on and on those why questions. So to really wonder about that very deeply and to, to look at a situation and to travel backwards to see where that might come from and where I might be connected to that so that there's a possibility of taking a next step and how am I responsible and what might I do? And so you know, and how might I be able to contribute from the skills that I have as an artist, which have to do with sometimes looking at really big situations and trying to find a core, something that you can say, oh, in this common sense kind of 
maybe it seems naive, maybe it seems simple, but sometimes you say it in that way and you go, you know, is this really what the situation is? Where sometimes we can have all of the, the complicated dialogue about things that distract us from what is really a core. So I feel like sometimes I'm able to do that. Sometimes I'm able to give an image to that, um, a story to that. I can stand there in support of that, in alliance with something. Anyway. Um, you said at one point that other people noticed that you were an artist and kind of told you you were an artist. I think it was back in the hospital context, maybe. Or, um, so you had at one point wanted to do medicine, and then um, always social justice, it sounds like. And then did yeah. you begin to think of yourself as an artist, and what were your inspirations, bread and puppet theater, but once you started working in, the, in this community? Well, the the... The thing about being an artist has been actually a hard hard thing for me to even say or to speak or even to say that I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. That has come very recent, um, actually. And, um, and, and here's the thing growing up in my family where that wasn't so great. Um, even though I think my father was an artist, actually. I think he was a musician mm -hmm. and um, he he could draw, but that wasn't something you do. That wasn't your life. That was maybe a way that you express yourself or, um, so that when I like started doing art, um, I couldn't even call it art. Um, and it didn't seem like it was the right thing to do coming out of my family structure. Mm -hmm. So it took, it took some years before I could actually say, you know, this is this is what I'm this is what I'm doing, and yeah, I'm a puppeteer. Um, you know, it, it's it's good work. It's it's okay. You know, um, I'm not a social worker. Um, I am a teacher. Uh, you know, which is when you're a woman, when you're a girl, growing up, that's what you're supposed to do. Right. Um, so it took a while, and then um, I think maybe I've never really understood what art is. Uh, I guess I'm. I still wonder uh, what it is. Um, but I've been called an artist now, and I've suddenly had to start saying that. Um, that it is a way of connecting um, and I read this once but I've tried going back and researching that the root word of art, A-R, means to connect like your arm, A-R-M and so like to, to know that art and art making and what you learn from art of how it does connect you to these different worlds is so important in all of the kinds of ways that even if you would say the social justice or the equity, building equity or conversation or relationship, um, relationship with yourself, with each other, with the world, with the interconnection, um, with the neighborhood, that art is a vehicle um, that is so deep and so amazing and can make solutions and creative insights to things that other forms of activism cannot bring forward. Mm -hmm. And so to, to try to find a way of speaking that um, where, uh, where people see that value, because there's a certain stigma about being an artist that, oh, it's just entered, like even the newspaper <laughs> at some point, it used to be called the art section, and then it became the arts and entertainment section, and then it was entertainment, and then it's now it's variety. Variety. Yeah. You know, like mm -hmm. even that, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. It's like to only see art as entertainment. And then also there's the whole money thing that's connected with it that's difficult. And with theater, it's really difficult because it becomes a expendable income kind of activity. Because like, I, you know, a lot of times I can't go to see the theater that I'd like to see on the income that I have earning as an artist. Mm -hmm. So like, what do you do with those questions? And then given that, am I gonna say, well, I'm an artist like, um, like the, the people who we call artists who are in those shows because I don't want people to think that they can't see my work or be connected to me mm. because of any reason of not having enough income um, or being from a, you know, uh, anyway, yeah, mm. you know? We do. So though, I think all of those kinds of things make it hard for me to say that I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, yeah. It seems all along you've, you were inventing your own um, career, I mean, your own path. I mean, things that didn't really exist when you were growing up. Um, to be a community liturgist, <laughs> to be, you know, social justice artist to be, I mean, you were creating this hybrid of something that was just always following your heart or what it was you needed to do. Um, but the other part of my question about finding, were there people who were doing work or that you, that you found inspiration from once you started developing your own way of working in the Twin Cities? Um, well, I think that there were some um, people who were very encouraging to me. Mm -hmm. Martha Bozing was one. Yeah. Uh, Martha Bozing um, from At the Foot of the Mountain Theater, she called me an artist. Mm -hmm. And um, she spoke to me in a way that um, you know, most people wouldn't speak to me. Mm -hmm. And um, she would critique the work that I'm doing in a very honest, good way that was, um, you know, that would go deeper than any of the sort of soundbite kinds of things that people might want to say. Um, also, Mary Delasour became a very important, um, you know, like, not a mentor that I spent huge amounts of time with, but she also saw the work and um, she became a friend and wrote some things sometimes for me and I took a lot of nourishment from her work. Mm -hmm. um, they really stand out. Um, also actually Brian Peterson who was the minister at Walker Church where uh -huh. our theater was in the basement, um, he also started calling me an artist, huh. uh, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, It takes a lot of people to produce a pageant like the, the May Day Parade and to produce the kind of theater you do, what sorts of relationships make that possible or made that possible? I mean, one hears about a model in the cities, uh, maybe from the children's theater of old, is the looming genius who is sort of a puppeteer for the entire operation. I don't think that's how you could possibly work. Uh, how did you find yourself working as you began to produce not sort of single puppets or single works, but pageants that required a lot of folks to get together? Um, you know, I think that um, I think that the incredible community of artists that have come together to be in the Heart of the Beast, or, or first Powderhorn Puppet Theater and then in the Heart of the Beast, um, 
that there is some synergy that was was fomenting, and it's it's hard hard to say exactly because it wasn't exact. It wasn't like we had an organizational structure that said, "Okay, this is what's going to make this total totally possible to work." But um, maybe the work was alluring, and um, because it was relevant and people who were connected to its relevance would come. Um, and maybe for different reasons, some the content of it, maybe some the music, maybe some the visual aspect or the movement aspect. And um, because it often takes many hands to, to make something, suddenly many hands would start coming forward. Um, the uh, you're creating as a puppeteer you create the characters um, so depending on whose hand is sculpting um, the puppet will become something that you know co comes out of yourself that is mysterious and wonderful and like I would like I described the act of making um, many many people are can you know love that act of making so many years with May Day We say okay. No new puppet making. We don't have any room. We can't we're gonna use old things and yeah I can use old things because maybe I made those right But people like to make and so mm -hmm. much community happens in the making like the paper macheing it's taught like there's nothing about it. That's fast or quick you have to sit there with patience, and then that's when the conversations happen. Um, it's not always easy. It's bumpy. And then there's the whole editing kind of process, which suddenly if you're a director of something and you have to make a decision, and you might say, oh, no, this, this is going to be edited out, and this is going to be in, and it's going to be like that, um, in a situation that has... Uh, a somewhat collective voice and suddenly you're starting to do that it's not easy and um, there's been broken hearts connected mm -hmm. with that and yet there is so much genius in the the camaraderie mm -hmm. and and I think even though people might remember very difficult times and conversations and wrestling I think it's that kind of depth that you go to that actually crafts the friendships in a very deep sort of way. And if not friendships, that it crafts the work with a really um, deep voice that not one person could have brought forward, that it really has come, you know, out of listening into many different kind of voices. It's not easy, and it's really hard to describe. As you think about the the time, you, the the, num the productions you've done over the years, do you tell a story about development, progress, change, unfolding, anything like that? I mean, do you have a sense of it, <coughs> of it as one thing emerging, or is your sense of, well, with every production we do something new, we start again? Um, it's, I, I feel like it's not necessarily that we, when we start, that we say we're going to do something new, because it's not like, or my, my purpose isn't to do something experimental, it's to find the truth of the moment. And so let's take May Day, for instance, and particularly the ceremony, um, because um, I, that's probably the place of so many voices and yet the wrestling of both practicalities, like how are you going to do, do what the big thought or what the big like necessity of what to say at this moment, how do you find it and then how do you do it? And, um, always with May Day, I have sleepless nights, wrestling, mm -hmm. wrestling with myself um, 
after listening, 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 and then how do I, how, how is this woven? How do I um, help midwife that? Um, what do I need to do to cut something and that painful part of it? Um, what, is, what is the honest thing to say? Um, what goes deeper than what a newspaper story might be or an issue um, dissecting something? What goes to a deeper place? Um, how do we find that? I'm always, I'm, I'm many sleepless nights with mm -hmm. May Day. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, I feel myself wrangling, like, mm -hmm. like some kind of thing is wrapped in me. And like, what is it going to be? And and then um, maybe something clear comes out of it. Maybe I bring that to the rehearsal, and then by walk by walking through it, or everybody coming to that wrangling, something emerges. This person has an amazing um, light of what this should be. My colleague Esther, like saying, no, it can't be that, no, <laughs> <laughs> that will make it go in a different direction. Um, yeah, the genius of the group and yet the, the will to, to just bring it to the ground, you know. Does that make sense? No. Totally. Oh no, yeah. How, <laughs> how did the um, how do you remember the ceremony involving uh, evolving into its current structure with the the sun being rowed across the water and the well and the, maple the, and the the actual the the kind of um, yeah, the, the, the main ritual elements that have become the ceremony. Yeah. Yeah, I can say how that how that happened. I mean, the very first one, very first May Day, we had a puppet that was like the maypole. Um, and we carried that, we ran it into the field, and we raised it, and everyone danced around it. Everyone, everyone who came, you know, like that's how many people there were, right? The pictures from it are pretty sweet and funny, and like really, there's a video from the first year even, which oh. is kind of interesting. And then many, many years where there weren't. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think that we, we had the consciousness of that we wanted to, um, a, you know, this, this time period with the name May Day, um, with these really important roots of both the change bringing of the earth and the labor history. And um, I would call it the red root of May Day, the blood root, and the green root. Mm -hmm. And those two things twined, um, always twining. You know, now I say, well, how can you even see them as separate roots? They're mm -hmm. so, like, it's mm -hmm. the brown root, right? <laughs> Red and green. But um, so we, we were conscious about that and knowing that um, uh, something is rising up not laying down like what would happen if we did something at the Halloween time. Um, uh, so that that was that was clear from the beginning and to put streamers on it was connected to like traditions of Nordic May Day celebrations like all over the world. Um, and then we started having something out in the lake that was like a winter, like an, um, or a winter, you know, like winter of our heart or something that we wanted to transform by fire. And so then we would have um, someone on shore who was connected to, um, that then we had started calling it a tree of life, who went out in the boat with a fire um, and set that puppet on fire. Mm. We did that for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and then it was like, oh, this is probably really bad environmentally for the lake. We're not doing mm -hmm. this anymore. Mm -hmm. And then um, we were uh, starting into the water years. We brought, um, coming across the lake, I can't remember whether we did, 
one year we brought a son, just a person in a canoe, one person in a canoe, um, in a sun mask. Come, it was Jim Uray coming across. Mm -hmm. Steve Epp was on. Mm -hmm. He was winter on the ground, you know, like in the ceremony field, and the sun came and defeated that person on stilts, mm -hmm. and that seemed right. Um, and then one year we had, um, by then we had the four big puppets, and I'll, I'll talk about those because they're really kind of vital and important. But we brought the water, the river, across with a flotilla of canoes with water creatures. And that was like, yes, this is so great to use the landscape of this beautiful place. And then it's probably the following year when we brought the sun in a flotilla of canoes, and that just seemed right. And that was like, well, yes, this is what the essential story is, is we are turning toward the sun. You know, people always say the sun is returning. That's not what's happening. Mm -hmm. The sun is always there. The earth is turning toward again. But the sun comes, arrives, and the, the tree of life rises. And then the story, um, a lot of times would develop uh, according to the foibles of the human world, how we, how we mess it up and how we have to try to find a right relationship again to basically be the tree of life, to receive it again, to renew that kind of energy. The four big puppets came because we were involved in uh, a national theater festival that actually happened in St. Peter, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And it was with Gustavus Adolphus College, and the name of the theater, oh dear, I can't remember. Um, but they were having a, a theater conference, um, and uh, they asked us to come and do an opening ceremony for that theater conference. And they had the idea that they wanted four different processions coming from the four directions, um, the woods, the river, the sky, and the prairie. Mm -hmm. So that's what we made, those four big puppets. We made, um, uh, we made the woods, came in from the north, we made that in Duluth. The river puppet actually came in on the water, and then the prairie and the sky as the, the eagle. Um, and, and they were also, um, connected with Mara de la Sur's poem, Let the Bird of Earth Fly. Mm -hmm. And so somehow we wanted to use that poem as the culmination of these four processions coming to the mound of an earth, each bringing a gift, which then, when the mound of the earth opened this large puppet of this bird with many, many hands on it, flew out. And the, the, the poem is really beautiful. And Maridel was there, and that's when I met Maridel. And I just, I'll never forget her coming in the door of the barn where we were working, and I was sculpting the big prairie mask, and she just stood there and went, oh. And then she told me once that, you know, when she read the poem, um, and it was in somewhere in St. Paul, and she was on a balcony, and all the puppets were standing there. And she said, so her face was in line with all the puppets. And she said she went home and expected her own face to be really big. But anyway, the poem, Let the Bird of Earth Fly. I send my voice of sorrow, calling, calling. My bowl is full of grief, and the wind is up. Thanks, the people are crying. Behold and listen. All is grown here where the sun goes down. The world within our hands flies upward like a bird. All that moves rejoices, approach each other as relatives. Mm -hmm. I bring you corn, I bring you love. Hey, hey, hey. Let the bird of earth loose, dove from the dark ark, flood out of the horizoned breast, the human flesh, light it 
like a lamp, all lighted, corn beetle and hill of dust. Hey, 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 let the bird of earth fly. I know that by heart, mm -hmm. that one. Mm -hmm. But it starts like I send my voice of sorrow, calling, calling. Mm -hmm. My bowl is full of grief and the wind is up. So we actually, the year after 911 happened, at the community meeting for May Day, the grief was so strong at that meeting. Mm -hmm. It was like people couldn't even go into what's possible or what's next. And so we knew that the ceremony had to be to transform grief into possibility, into action mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. And so we actually um, used that poem for the ceremony that year, writing the words, big pieces of cloth and animating them mm -hmm. in different ways. So that's been really useful. Mm -hmm. I think that's that was after Maridel had died. We, we used, there was another one where she was still alive where um, we did, the theme was about corn and the origins of corn. She was still alive for that one. Was that was when, when she was in a wheelchair decorating yeah, I think so. corn? Yeah, mm -hmm. Louis Alamayhu pushing mm -hmm. her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very special. Uh, you said something I think is just so amazing. There's so much genius in the camaraderie of making, essentially, you were saying. And um, I noticed being with you how um, embodied you are, and it seems like there's so much genius also in the camaraderie of moving in a body. And that's part of your direction every May Day. I mean, there's this movement of the parade, and the procession was an early part of what you experienced, it sounds like, too, in your political life. Um, but do you also think of yourself as a choreographer? Well, I would never define myself that <laughs> way, mm -hmm. um, but I definitely think mm -hmm. in movement. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, puppets, just inherent, they don't live unless they breathe and move. Um, so even, mm -hmm. even if you're just creating a very small show, um, you know, how something moves is, speaks, it speaks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I'm not like, actually, um, I'm not a choreographer like people who are choreographers. Yeah, it's like everything you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not at anything, and that's the problem. Oh, well, that's wonderful. I remember an early grant we wrote, and we, it, they didn't fund us, right? And they said, um, I'm sorry, we fund, um, what did they say? Theater, dance, and music, but not puppets. I was like, <laughs> it is theater. <laughs> exactly. It's a different time now. Mm -hmm. The puppet, I mean, when we started, you know, no one knew anything about puppets, including me. Um, and now the whole puppet world has just exploded in very interesting and mm -hmm. wonderful ways. Mm -hmm.